Amen. And our sermon reading for today, John 14, 15 through 18. And if you'll join with us, Jesus speaking to his disciples, this is at the end of his life. He's going to be very soon heading to the cross, the empty tomb. And Jesus says this, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate, a helper, to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And that's going to be a powerful one. I will not leave you as orphans, Jesus says. I will come to you. So here we are. We're looking at this uh, sermon series, The Life You've Always Wanted, John Ortberg. And we're looking at different practices that literally bring us into the very loving presence of God, I call it. And as we come into that loving presence of God, this is where God transforms us. This is where we find the healing that we need. In fact, the very first message that we talked about in this series was the fact that we're all God's masterpieces. And in the midst of that, created in the image of God, somehow sin has come in and it's... it's, Deface part of that image of God within us. And when I talk about that healing and that transformation, I'm talking about God coming back and making that, that change within us, reforming us and renewing us and restoring us. Now, as we, I think about this, and I, many times in my life I grew up within the church. I very seldom ever heard a message like I heard, like you're going to hear today. I'm just telling you. And this message today is going to be about the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit's purpose and job is within our lives, within the world. And, and it's powerful. And if we get this right today, it's, it, it's life-changing. It is truly life-changing if we get this right. Um, <clears throat> today's message is important because if you really want to live the life you've always wanted to, if you want to grow, if you want to be all that you've been designed to be, we are going to have to trust and believe that God communicates with us And gives us real direction in our lives. To trust and believe that God speaks to us. I mean, it's one thing to speak to God. But it's another thing for God to speak to us. And I think the question we have to ask is, God speaks, are we listening to God speaking to us? Because if you're going to have a relationship with God in any kind of a personal manner whatsoever, you have to be open to the fact that not only is God present, but that God communicates and speaks to us, and God is leading us and guiding us. And most of the way that he does that is through his Holy Spirit that lives in us. So we have to get a hold of this. It's a non-optional part of our transformation. It's about being ready to hear from God and to move where God speaks to us. Like, um, I think of Samuel in the Old Testament. Samuel, um, Hannah couldn't have a baby, she, and God blesses her. She finally has a baby. She dedicates him to God, and it's Samuel, and she literally has him growing up at the temple, okay? This is, this is where he, he grows up. And one night he's sleeping, and he hears somebody call Samuel, and he's like, uh, who is it? So he runs over to uh, who would be like the priest, Eli, says, have you called me? He says, no, I haven't called you. Go back to bed. Well, this happens about two or three more times, and finally he gets smart enough. He says, is God talking to you? Maybe you should listen next time. So the next time he goes back, he lays down, and he hears Samuel, God literally speaking out loud to him. And what he says is this, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. This has got to be our prayer right here. This has to be our life. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. But we have to be prepared to hear it. We have to be in such a place in our life that we can live the unhurried life and we can focus ourselves to where we can hear God speaking truth to us in our lives. Now, years ago, there was a play, uh, and the name of the play was Search for Signs of Intelligent Life in the Universe. And Lily Tomlin, who I always liked, uh, was a part of that play, and she had a line in that play, and this is it. She says, why is it that when we speak to God, we are praying, but when God speaks to us, we're thought of as being schizophrenic? And isn't that the truth? That's how it is today. So you hear from God, mm, you know, something's a little off with you, right? But the reality is God speaks, and we should be ready to hear and listen and to move forward. Because that's one of the most amazing aspects of a personal God is that God communicates with us and wants to lead us and wants to guide us. And that's why this, this message is called the guided life. 
Because God wants to do that for us. God has always wanted to be known and communicated with us. And he speaks in so many different ways. In fact, all of the whole Bible is about this right here. The fact that there's this transcendent God who is, who is creator and created the world and created humanity and everything else that you see here. And, and But this transcendent God is consistently coming and communicating and impacting and touching this world in real history and real lives with us. That's who God is. That's what the Bible's about. I mean, we see different ways God talks to us throughout the scripture. Like, uh, just, just think about the, the story with Adam and Eve. God walks with them, talks with them in the garden. Well, that, that's pretty awesome. We see God does it in other ways. Like uh, with Moses, he spoke through a burning bush. Remember that one? He never did that one again. He spoke through a burning bush. He doesn't have to do that one again. He spoke to Moses other ways, like with his finger, and he wrote the Ten Commandments onto tablets of stone and said, here, this is how I'm communicating with you. Go ahead and share that with them now. And, and he talked with a very clear voice like he did to Samuel or others. He talks through persons and prophets. In fact, the very word prophet means to be a mouthpiece for God. God gives something to the prophet, and he speaks for God, and he talks through other people. Goodness gracious, he even spoke through a donkey one time. Do you know that? Balaam the prophet. God literally speaks through a donkey. Okay? So I want you to understand God can speak to us however God wants to. He speaks to us in dreams and visions. He speaks to us, and this is probably the biggest way, through the scripture, the very Bible as we read that. God speaks to us. He's spoken to us through Jesus, and now we understand he speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that today. It's like... Uh, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says at the very beginning in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets. And in many times and in various ways, he talked to us. But lately, the last one, the big one, is he spoke to us by his son. And, and he revealed all that he is through that. See, John Ortberg calls these, these times of God speaking to us these promptings of God. And they come in lots of different ways. Maybe he convicts us of a sin where you're like, oh, yeah, I, I shouldn't be doing that. And that's God speaking to us. Maybe it's God's way of just sharing with us that assurance of God's love for us. You've ever felt that one before where God just assured you that he loved you unconditionally? You're like, yeah, that's awesome. And, and maybe it's even, uh, you know, I'm just thinking of all these different ways that, that God could do that where he speaks to us. Maybe he calls us to action or to do something. But it's crucial to understand the spirit-guided life and that we listen and that we do what God asks us to do. So what I, what I want you to do right now is just take a quick moment. Think of a time when you knew God was speaking to you. I'm going to give you a few seconds here. Think of a time where God, when you just knew God was speaking to me. Think about it. How did you know God was speaking? You just knew it. In your spirit, in your heart, in your, in, your, in your mind, you knew God was speaking to me. You know, that could be literally every moment of every day in our lives because I believe God wants to speak to us and lead us and guide us. And it happens through the Holy Spirit. You know, I can think of so many times in my life where God spoke to me. And, and God spoke not only just clearly to me, sometimes it was literally in an audible voice. Sometimes it was through other people. Sometimes it was um, through, through things like the, the Word of God, which is a big one in my life where God spoke to me. Um, sometimes it was just through a leading or a prompting um, where I just knew I was supposed to go a certain direction. I began to take that step in that direction. I just felt the peace of God. And I'm like, yeah, God's speaking to me to go. There's so many ways that God speaks to us in our lives. So here's where we start. John 14, verses 15 through 18. Now, Jesus in John 14, 15, and 16 talks a lot about the Holy Spirit. I gave you an insert in your bulletin that you can take home and study, which is very good. And then at the end of the thing here, there's a place that says scripture in the bulletin as well. And I put a bunch more scripture in there so you can take this and study it and get this into you and into your life so you can get a hold of this. Now, here's what's happened. John 14, Jesus, Jesus literally tells his disciples, I'm going. You're not going to see me anymore. I've got a cross, an empty tomb, and I'm going back to heaven. Physically, I'm going to be gone from this world, okay? They're very heartbroken and they're sad. But he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. 
you can trust in God and trust in me because in my father's house there are many rooms. If it weren't so, I told you, but I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And when the time is perfect and right, I will take you and you will always be with me. It's a beautiful passage. And right after that, Jesus says, now you know where I'm going. And the disciples are like, we, we don't know where you're going. We don't know what you're talking about. How are we supposed to get there if we don't know where we're going? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Right here, that's how you're going to get there. So Jesus begins to teach right after this. And he says, if you love me, you're going to obey what I command. Now, interesting, you got to get this, okay? If we truly love Jesus, how is it going to be displayed? What, what are we going to do? We're going to be obedient to God and what Jesus says. If we're obedient to God and what Jesus says, it shows that we love God. See how he's connected these two together. But how are we going to be obedient? How, how are we going to know, Jesus, you're leaving? How, how are we going to be obedient and, and do the things we're supposed to do. Jesus says, that's okay. You see, I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to give you another counselor to be with you forever. I'm going away. My physical presence is going, but this is going to be with you forever, called the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you will know him for two prepositions here, for he lives with you, and he will be in you. I'm not going to leave you as orphans, Jesus said. I'm going to come to you physically like I am right now, no. But my spirit is going to be right there with you and in you. See, those are powerful words. That word for, for counselor there that Jesus says the spirit of truth is going to be, literally the word in the, in the original language is paraclete. And it means this. It means one who is alongside, one who is your helper or your defender, one who gives you guidance and support. And he says, the world's not going to understand this. They don't know the Spirit, but you do. He's with you. He's in you. Yes, my physical presence is leaving. But the next chapter, he says, that's a good thing. Because when my physical presence is here, I can be with you 12, maybe right here. But the next town over, I'm not there. But when I go, the Father sends the Spirit, and it's everywhere. Everyone is connected. You see how that works? It's a beautiful passage. See, Jesus promises he will be with us forever through the Holy Spirit. And then in the next uh, chapter or two, Jesus really makes this a big, um, I guess, a, a teaching time about this complete intimacy and unity. And he says, you know what? I'm in the Father, the Father's in me. But guess what? I'm in you and you're in me and you're in the Father and the Father's in you. And we've got this, this beautiful intimacy here, this connection, this unity together. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to take care of you. The Spirit here with us to help us in our life. Jesus says that's how it is. But that's how the Holy Spirit is all the time. Um, uh, A.W. Tozier said this, When we have the Holy Spirit, we have all that is needed to be all that God desires us to be. And I truly believe this. That is so true. Think about the scriptures uh, where the Spirit is there leading. You know, Luke really focuses in on this at the beginning of his uh, book that he writes, in his gospel. And he talks about all the different people, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they have the Holy Spirit that's upon them. And John the Baptist will have the Holy Spirit upon him it's from his birth, it even says. And then Jesus gets baptized. He comes up out of the water, and the Spirit descends upon him like a dove, and the Holy Spirit's right there. And then we find out about this man named Simeon. You know, G Jesus was born, and, and, and he's only eight days old. And, and Simeon was told by God that he was going to see the Messiah before he dies. And we find out that Simeon is not only a person who uh, is filled with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit reveals truths to him. And then it says, and he was led by the Holy Spirit to go to the temple, and he meets Jesus, this powerful encounter. So Jesus now is filled with the Holy Spirit, and the next thing that happens after he comes out of his baptism, 30 years old, filled with the Holy Spirit, he says that he is led by the Spirit out into the wilderness. See, the Spirit's already at work, leading him where he needs to go. He gets done with the wilderness thing, 40 days in the wilderness, his ministry started, and what happens? He gets a scroll out, he reads Isaiah, and the Holy Spirit has come upon me so that I can carry out my ministry that I'm going to go do. And we're supposed to understand that the Spirit is leading everything that's happening there. He doesn't say that the rest of the book. Every time Jesus does something, he doesn't say, and the Holy Spirit led Jesus to this town. You're just supposed to know this is what's happening, okay? The Spirit is powerful. But there was only for a few people here and there and there and there. Jesus says, when I go, the Spirit's going to come on everybody into your lives. 
So here's the, well, I, I gave you this as your insert, and I think this is so important that we understand this, the Holy Spirit's job in our life. Number one, John 14, 15 to 17, was what Jesus said. He's our helper. He's going to lead us and take care of us. He's our advocate right there with us. Right behind this, 25 and 26, he says, Jesus says the Holy Spirit's our teacher. It's our, he's our interpreter. He's, he's going to remind us of all the truths Jesus has and help us live them in our lives. You get to chapter uh, 15, 26 through 27, and Jesus says um, about the witness in the midst of that, that the Holy Spirit is going to be a witness for us and help us to witness. 16, 5 through 11, this is the one here that you can look through. This is interesting because Jesus said the, the world doesn't know the Spirit, that it doesn't recognize the Spirit's work, but the Spirit is still at work in the world because he tells us that the Holy Spirit is here to convince and convict the world. So that they might believe. And so the Holy Spirit's at work with people who don't even have the Spirit, but he's in people's lives trying to draw them to the place where they would believe and follow Jesus. And then 16, 12 through 15, it says that the Holy Spirit's going to be this revealer for us. He's going to guide us, and he's going to lead us into all truth. Jesus says the Spirit's going to take what's mine and make it known to you. Isn't that the most amazing thing? The Spirit at work in our lives. But we've got to understand it. So you take that home and study it because that's important. But here's the first steps I think we've got to get through to understand this. Number one, to understand this, we have to believe, fully believe that when we follow Jesus, give our lives to Jesus, as Jesus says, when we're born again, when we believe in Jesus, that God puts his Holy Spirit in us. Can we believe that? Did you know that in your life? Did you know that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you? Everybody, that's powerful stuff, and it's there for a reason, not to lay around dormant until you go to heaven, okay? It's there for a reason in our lives. God places his spirit in us. It reminds me of uh, like Ephesians chapter 1, which is a great passage. You should read that one. Verses 13 and 14. Now, Paul has just said that, uh, that he's some of the first ones who believed in Jesus and that Jesus has done all these amazing spiritual things in his life. And then he comes down in verse 13, he says, and now you also have heard the truth, the good news of Jesus, that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ and Jesus, he identified you as his own by giving you his Holy Spirit that he promised long ago. And the word there is that he sealed you. Like remember those old envelopes you used to see in movies? And they'd pour hot wax down, and there's a certain seal, and they push it into that wax, and you knew it was sealed. This is, this is who that belongs to. You don't break that open, okay, because it belongs to that person right there. We are sealed. We belong to God. He's given us the Holy Spirit into us, proving that we belong to him. And it's the, the Spirit is God's guarantee that he's going to give us everything he's promised, that we've been a, a people purchased by God. But that was promised long ago. You can go back, all the way back to Ezekiel 26. This, this is like centuries and centuries before where people were not doing the things they should have been doing. And God says, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to take this heart of stone out of here, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. And that, that's good. He says, better than that, he says, I'm going to give you a whole new spirit. In fact, I'm going to give you my spirit. And I'm going to put it inside of you so that you will follow my decrees and my laws and you'll live the way that you're supposed to live. He promised that centuries earlier. And Jesus says, here it is now for us in our lives. It reminds me like Romans. This is another great one. Romans 8, verse 1. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is a wonderful passage. As he gets through here, it's kind of like my message from last week. See, you can either be living under the influence and the direction of the Holy Spirit, or you can be living under the influence and the direction of your, your flesh, your sinful nature, that's not leading you to the place where God wants you to be. He says, but you are not controlled by that sinful nature anymore. You are now controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you, which Jesus just told us we do. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them, they don't belong to him at all. But if we belong to him, we have the Spirit. And that's a powerful thought to lead us and guide us into the lives that we are called to live in. And just a few verses past that, he says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the true children of God. And we've received this adoption 
through the Spirit that we cry out, Abba, Father, and Abba is like an Aramaic word for dad, a very personal, close term. So we cry out, Dad, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. The Spirit literally talks to us. It's inside of us and brings us to that point of understanding. See, God speaks to us and leads us and guides us. It's in our thoughts, it's in our, our hearts, our spirits, our minds, whatever it is. Do you believe that? I mean, do you believe that? Do you believe that the Holy Spirit lives in you for a purpose? We have to believe that first. First step to give us that guided life. So the second step is this. We must believe that not only that the Spirit lives in us, but God speaks to us and leads us and guides us through that Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, another great passage where he's talking about the difference of godly wisdom and what God wants for us and worldly wisdom, which sounds pretty good but really is not, okay? And as we get to this point, here's what Paul writes for us, maybe. There it is. As he talks about the spiritual wisdom that God has given us. But it was given to us, uh, but it was to us that God revealed these things, the spiritual truths, by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. I like the way verse 11 here it says, No one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. It's like you. Can you tell what I'm thinking? No. The only one that can tell what I'm thinking is my spirit knows. I can't tell what you're thinking, I don't, but your spirit knows. In the exact same way, no one knows what God's thinking except for his spirit, but where is his spirit now? In us. Oh, okay. So powerful that it's, as he gets through a couple verses later, he says this, and this is a quote out of the Old Testament, for who has known the mind of the Lord that we could instruct him? You know, nobody does. He says, but guess what? We have the mind of Christ in us because the Holy Spirit's in us. Teaching us the things God wants us to know, leading us and guiding us into our lives of where we're supposed to go. So first we have to believe the Spirit's here. Second, we have to believe that, this, that God speaks to us and leads us through that Spirit. <clears throat> and third step is we have to train ourselves to listen to the Spirit and walk in the Spirit's leading. Like in Galatians 5, 16, Paul says, So I say to you, walk by the Spirit, which means be led by the Spirit. And you're not going to gratify the desires of the sinful nature, that flesh. For the, the flesh and the Spirit, they're, they're contrary. They want contrary things. My sinful nature takes me away from what God wants. God's Spirit takes me toward what God wants. Boom. They're in conflict with each other, okay? But if you are led by the Spirit, he says, you are not under the law. Here's what he's trying to tell us. God says, here's my heart, this thing called the law. All these laws written out. This is how you're supposed to act. This is how you're supposed to behave. This is how you're supposed to treat one another. This is what you're supposed to do. And you go, man, that's a lot of stuff, God. How am I going to keep all this straight? He says, you don't even have to worry about all that. You let the Spirit lead you, and the Spirit is going to lead you exactly to follow everything that's in there, so you don't even have to worry about it because you're going to be doing it if you allow the Spirit to lead you that way. Oh, that sounds easier. Just listen to the Spirit, and he's going to show you the way. So what's that going to look like? Well, he goes on to say, it, it, the Spirit, this is what he gives us. It's the fruit of the Spirit. You've heard this before. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control within our lives. And that's just the beginning of it. Because those who belong to Jesus, they've crucified that old sinful self. They don't want to go that direction anymore. They want to be led by the Spirit. And that, that last line, for we get our new life from the Spirit, so we should follow the Spirit wherever the Spirit's going to lead us. See how that works? Believe the Spirit's there. Number two, believe that God speaks to us. Number three, walk in step with the Spirit, and you're going to go where God wants you to go. You're going to be who God wants you to be. You're going to do what God wants you to do in every aspect of life. Because being guided by the Spirit is a powerful thing. Oop, went too far. There we go. So being led by the Spirit and guided by the Spirit, listening to God, it's not this, okay? And I want you to get a hold of this. It is not getting insider information. In other words, we don't have the Spirit here in, front, in, our, in our lives so we can say, God, give me the right Powerball number so I can get rich, all right? That's not God's purpose in this. That's not what, what God's really looking for. 
Now, it's good to pray for her and be open to the big things in life, you know, like um, marriage and jobs and schools and children and whether I should move and those kinds of things. But we must learn to seek God's wisdom in, in, in leading in all things, even the seemingly small things, because God teaches us how to live in our faith journey that way, of who we're supposed to be and what we're supposed to do as we listen to these small things and the Spirit prompts us to do these things and that moves us where we're supposed to go. Number two, being guided by the Holy Spirit is not about being proud or, or wearing this big uh, badge of spiritual importance because of it. Well, God speaks to me, I'm pretty important. He does not speak to you quite the same, you see. Where, but no, God speaks to everybody differently. And he speaks to everybody, okay? This is not about some pride issue. I like what John Ortberg says at this, and, and this is another thing. He says it's not the same as just being passive in your life. And he had a friend who was seeking a new job. He says, that's my dream job. I would love to have that job right there. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to seek after it. I'm not going to apply for it. And I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. And when, isn't this going to be amazing when God gives me that job, right? Because I'm just not going to do anything. It shows that that's God's will, that it took place that way. And he's like, duh, you, you're not going to get the job if you don't do something for it, you know? Just being passive doesn't work because it assumes that whatever happens as a result of me being passive makes it God's will, and that does not happen. Now, there are times where things pop up out of nowhere and God uses them, and, 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 and we can step into those things. I mean, there's times I wasn't even thinking about this, and all of a sudden God puts this thing in front of me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I go do it. But just to sit back and be passive and assume that, that somehow it's going to be God's will because I didn't do anything doesn't make sense whatsoever. I think God's given us brains and intellect and reason where to use these things so that we can seek God's will and guidance and leading. So God can begin to teach us to walk in the ways that we're supposed to walk. And the last one, it's really about God. He wants to teach us to make good decisions and learn so we can learn God's pattern. That... Um, it's always good to listen and be ready to hear God's voice in every decision we make, every activity we go through. <clears throat> but we need to learn how to make good choices ourselves. And he likens it to a, a child who's had parents who made every decision for him their entire life and then sends them out in the world and says, go make good decisions. How well are they going to do? Not well, because they've never learned how to make a decision because they've just relied upon someone to do it for them. It can't be that way. And you would be amazed how many people I've seen come to church, sit in church their whole lives, and all they know is, here's what the pastor says, do this, don't do that, touch this, don't touch that, be this, don't be that. You know, they just tell me, that, here's my rules, here's, here's your legalism, just fill into that thing. And they have never learned how to make a decision based on the Holy Spirit leading them to do something or to not do something. And they, they, just, they, they can't do it. We are supposed to learn how to allow the Spirit to lead us and teach us and guide us and take us to the places where we're supposed to go. You know, I, I, I liken it like a, someone who's just a recovering alcoholic, okay? They're a recovering alcoholic, and, and, and they're really struggling at this time, and, and everybody at work is going to hit the bar that night, and they're going to stay and party hard all night long. And he said, well, God, do, do, I don't know. I'm kind of torn here. Do you think I should go with them to the bar, or maybe should I go somewhere else? And God's like, duh, right? What do you think? <laughs> You've got to start making decisions for yourself that make some sense, okay? And, and, okay, maybe I shouldn't be there at that time. Or someone who's struggling with, with pornography, and, and the whole family's going to be gone the whole night long, and so you go sit right in front of the computer and tempt yourself, well, God, should I be sitting here doing this, or maybe should I be doing something else? God's like, duh, Right? You know what you should be doing. Start making good, sound decisions. You've got to start learning to do this yourself. You don't have to ask me everything. You should know some of these things by now. And you should start living them. Right? That's who God wants us to be. Because as we hear God's word and leading through the Spirit, we begin to walk um, the way... Uh, 
that God wants us to. And we begin to learn God's patterns and God's character and God's movement so that we don't have to just ask God all the time. We just kind of get a flow. We know where we're supposed to be going, what we're supposed to be doing. So how does God guide us through the Holy Spirit and lead us? Number one, we learn to listen to the Spirit's leading continually. I know, I know, I know. But preacher, we got jobs, we got all this stuff going on, and we're working, and we're talking, we're living all of life's demands. But at the same time, you can be praying. At the same time, you can be attentive and open to the Spirit speaking, leading, prompting you where you should go. Be aware of God's presence at all times. Number two, and I like John Ortberg puts it this way, be relentlessly responsive and obedient. If God gives you a prompting uh, and, and, and begins to lead you somewhere or some movement, do it. Don't, don't say, well, maybe next week we'll get to it. Do it. And if you can't do it at that moment, jot down a note. You know what I do? I send myself emails all the time. Anybody ever do that? It's like, uh, there's this thing God's shown me, and, and there's no way I'm going to remember this by the time I get back home tonight. So I send myself an email, and then I'm like, there it is. Now I got it. Now I know. You see? Take those promptings. Be relentlessly responsive and obedient. And number three, listen for the Spirit's voice through anything that God wants to speak to you through. You know, it might be through the Bible, God's Word. It might be through the voice of others. It might be through music. It might be through church service. It might be through nature. It might, who knows how God's going to speak, but be open to that thing and ready. And I know it seems overwhelming at times to think about this. That's why we start with the simple and the small things. Just listen as God's Spirit gets you, go, okay, okay, and begin to allow, allow that to happen in our lives. And to recognize that God speaks to everybody differently, and it's okay, and to move forward in that area.